How often have you wondered what your spouse is really thinking, or your boss, or the guy sitting across from you on the bus? We all take as a given that we'll never really know for sure. The content of our thoughts is our own, private, secret, unknowable by anyone else, until now, that is. Neuroscience research into how we think and what we're thinking is advancing at a stunning rate, making it possible for the first time in human history to peer directly into the brain to read out the physical makeup of our thoughts. Some would say, to read our minds. This is the technology that is transforming what once was science fiction into just plain science. It's a specialized use of MRI scanning called functional MRI, fMRI for short, that makes it possible to see what's going on inside the brain while people are thinking. Every time I walk into that scanner room and I see the person's brain appear on the screen, when I see those patterns, it is just incredible, unthinkable. Mind reading, I, what do you call it? Thought identification. Whatever you want to call it, what neuroscientist Marcel Just and his colleague Tom Mitchell at Carnegie Mellon University have done is combine fMRI's ability to look at the brain in action with computer science's new power to sort through massive amounts of data. The goal? To see if they could identify exactly what happens in the brain when people think specific thoughts. Okay, you ready to get started? They did an experiment where they asked subjects to think about ten objects, five of them tools like screwdriver and hammer, and five of them dwellings like igloo and castle, then recorded and analyzed the activity in their brains for each. You had them think about a screwdriver, mm -hmm. and the computer found the place in the brain where that person was thinking screwdriver? The screwdriver isn't one place in the brain, it's many places in the brain. When you think of a screwdriver, you think about how you hold it, how you twist it, what it looks like, what you use it for. And each of those functions are in different places? Correct. Just says when we think screwdriver, or igloo for example, neurons start firing at varying levels of intensity in different areas throughout the brain. And we found that we could identify which object they were thinking about from their brain activation patterns. You're reading their mind. We're identifying the thought that's occurring. It's Whoa. incredible, just incredible. Are you saying that if you think of a hammer, that your brain is identical to my brain when I think of a hammer? Not identical. We have idiosyncrasies. Maybe I've had a bad experience with a hammer and you haven't, but it's close enough to identify each other's thoughts. So, it, you know, that was never known before. We asked if his team was up for a challenge. Would they take our associate producer, Megan Frank, whose brain had never been scanned before, and see if the computer could identify her thoughts? Justin Mitchell agreed to give it a try and see if they could do it in almost real time. So you've never done an instant analysis, as we might say on television? Nobody's done this ever. ever. That's Every actually second. her brain? That's her brain. Inside the scanner, Megan was shown a series of 10 items and asked to think for a few seconds about each one. If it all comes out right, when she's thinking hammer, the computer will know she's thinking hammer. Right. Okay, we're all done. So, Megan. Yes. How was it? It wasn't bad. Good. Within minutes, the computer, unaware of what pictures Megan had been shown and working only from her brain activity patterns as read out by the scanner, was ready to tell us in its own voice what it believed was the first object Megan had been thinking about. I think the word is knife. <gasps> All right, That's one. Right. Bingo. <laughs> All right. Then the second. I think the word is hammer. All right. <laughs> I think the word is window. It's perfect, right? So far. And it continued to be, word after word. Apartment. <laughs> ten out of ten. Ten out of ten. <laughs> well done, well done. <laughs> and of course, this is just the beginning. Exactly. Who knows what you're going to be able to read. That's a little right. scary, actually. Well, th that's our research program for the next five years. What? To see what, how, you know, we're not satisfied with Hammer. <laughs> and neither a neuroscientist 4,000 miles away in Berlin at the Bernstein Center. John Dylan Haynes is hard at work here, using the scanner not just to identify objects people are thinking about, but to read their intentions. So we're going to start now with the actual experiment. Subjects were asked to make a simple decision, whether to add or subtract two numbers they would be shown later on. Haynes found he could read directly from the activity in this small part of the brain that controls intentions what they had decided to do. This is a kind of blown up version of the brain activity happening here. And you can see that if a person is planning to add or to subtract, the pattern of brain activity is different in these two cases. I always tell my students that there is no science fiction anymore. All the science fiction I read in high school, we're doing. To Paul Root Wolpe, director of the Center for Ethics at Emory University in Atlanta, the ability to read our thoughts and intentions this way is revolutionary. Throughout history, we could never actually coerce someone to reveal information. Torture doesn't work that well. Persuasion doesn't work that well. The right to keep one's thoughts locked up in their brain is amongst the most fundamental rights of being human. You're saying that if someone can read my intentions, we have to talk about who might in the future be able to do that. Absolutely. Whether we're going to let the state do it or whether we're going to let me do it. I have two teenage daughters. 
I come home one day and my car is dented, and both of them say they didn't do it. Am I going to be allowed to drag them off to the local brain imaging lie detection company and get them put in a scanner? We don't know. But before we've even started the debate, there are two companies already offering lie detection services using brain scans. One with the catchy name No Lie MRI. But our experts caution that the technique is still unproven. In the meantime, Haynes is working on something he thinks may be even more effective, reading out from your brain exactly where you've been. Haynes showed me an experiment he created out of a video game. And you can actually navigate around if you want. He had me navigate through a series of rooms in different virtual reality houses. Now I would put you in a scanner, and I would show you some of these scenes that you've seen and some scenes that you haven't seen. Well, I haven't seen so, um, anything yet. Oh, okay. And, um, okay, now I'm getting into familiar territory. Do you recognize something? Yeah, I, I recognize the bar. And right at this moment, we would be able to tell from your brain activity that you've already seen this environment before. And so this is a potential tool for it's police a tool. Absolutely. in the case of break-ins. You might be able to tell if someone's been in an Al-Qaeda training camp before. Have any uh, uh, national security agencies been in touch with you? Not in, not in the U.S. <laughs> Anywhere in the world? Uh, yes, in, yes. in uh, Germany, but... Uh... So there are people who are considering these kinds of possibilities. And using them. In India last summer, a woman was convicted of murder after an EEG of her brain allegedly revealed that she was familiar with the circumstances surrounding the poisoning of her ex-fiancé. Can you, through our legal system, be forced to take one of these tests? It's a great question, and the legal system hasn't decided on this yet. But we do have a Fifth Amendment. We don't have to uh, incriminate ourselves. Well, here's where it gets very interesting. Because the Fifth Amendment only prevents the courts from forcing us to testify against ourselves. But you can force me to give DNA or a hair sample or, or blood, even if that would incriminate me. So here's the million-dollar question. If you can brain image me and get information directly from my brain, is that testimony? Or is that like DNA, blood, semen, and other things that you could take from me? Court case, there, inevitable. There will be a Supreme Court case about this. There you go. For now, it's impossible to force someone to have his or her brain scanned because the subject has to lie still and cooperate. But that could change. There are some other technologies that are being developed that may be able to be used covertly and even remotely. So, for example, they're trying to develop now a beam of light that would be projected onto your forehead. It would go a couple of millimeters into your frontal cortex, and then receptors would get the reflection of that light. And there's some studies that suggest that we could use that as a lie detection device. And we wouldn't know we've got a red dot in our forehead? No, you wouldn't. We if you wouldn't were know. sitting there in the airport and being questioned, yeah. they could beam that on your forehead without your knowledge. We can't do that yet, but they're working on it. Scary as that is, imagine a world where companies could read our minds, too. Light beams may be a bit far off, but fMRI scanning is already being used to try to figure out what we want to buy and how to sell it to us. It's a new field called neuromarketing. One of its pioneers is neuroscientist Gemma Calvert, co-founder of a London company called Neurosense. Do you have a lot of clients? Yes, such as uh, Unilever, Intel, mm -hmm. McDonald's, Procter & Gamble, uh, MTV or Viacom. And she says it's a growing field. What we've seen is a sort of snowballing effect over the last few years. I think there are about 92 neuromarketing agencies worldwide. But some experts question whether it's ethical to scan the brain for commercial purposes and say neuromarketers may be promising more than they can really deliver. If you image my brain and you say, aha, Paul craves chocolate chip cookies, and I say, no, I don't. Now, are you going to believe the brain over me? You can only do that if you have proven that that part of the brain lighting up means in all cases that that person desires chocolate chip cookies. And what a lot of people are doing is they're just imaging the brain, then they're declaring what that means, and they're never proving that it actually translates into behavior. You know, it's very interesting. When you show someone a brain scan, people just believe it. It just reeks of credibility. Absolutely, and, absolutely. And you telling me that's the area where people add and subtract, I thought, well, of course, he knows. Well, I could have told you anything. I know. So as brain imaging continues to advance and find its way into the courts, the market, and who knows what other aspects of our lives, one message is be cautious. Another is get ready. Back at Carnegie Mellon, Just and Mitchell have already uncovered the signatures in our brains for kindness, hypocrisy, and love. It's breathtaking. Yes. And kind of eerie. Well, you know, I think the reason people have that reaction is it because it reveals the essence of what it means to be a person. All of those kinds of things that define us as human beings are brain patterns. We don't want to know that. <laughs> well, that it all boils down to uh, I don't know, molecules and things like that. But we are, you know, we are biological creatures. You know, our limbs, we accept our, you know, muscles and bone. And our brain is a biological thinking machine. Do you think one day, who knows how far into the future, there'll be a machine that'll be able to read very complex thought, like, um, I hate so-and-so, or, you know, I love the ballet because... Definitely, definitely. definitely. And, and, not, and not in 20 years, I think in three, five years. Ample in three does. years? Well, five. <laughs>